so to follow this idea of the challenge of cross-fertilization between discipline, uh, today we wanted to explore the idea of design in different research fields. Uh, this will, be, will happen in the next days. Today our first speaker will do it in the field of biomedicine. So I'm very pleased and honored to welcome Professor Caris Thompson. Professor Thompson joined the Department of Sociology of the London School of Economics from the University of California, Berkeley, where she was Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and a former director of the Science, Technology and Society Center. Before moving to Berkeley, she was in the History of Science Department of Harvard University. Uh, she is the author of Making Parents, the Ontological Choreography of Reproductive Technology, which won the 2007 Rachel Carson Award from the Society for the Social Studies of Science. And her last book, Good Science, the Ethical Choreography of Stem Cells Research, has been published last year by the MIT Press. So I'm very pleased to welcome our first keynote speaker. Good morning, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, Professor Volante and to Dr. Manuela Perotto. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm, uh, it's a, uh, I'm a little jet lagged because I've come all the way from California because I go between Berkeley and London, um, but it's really lovely to be here. Um, and welcome to everyone for the beginning of what looks like being a wonderful uh, conference. Um, I'm excited to learn about Italian STS, and I'm excited to learn more about design as well. Um, in the brief for this uh, talk, I had uh, two relatively significant uh, problems. Uh, one was the idea of uh, talking, which is the first one is more psychological, the idea of talking about design as a kind of you know, ugly middle-aged British woman going to Italy and talking about design where everybody is chic and everything is chic and it's almost like a, 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 an oxymoron that this couldn't be possible. Um, and my, my second problem is that I actually don't know what design is. Um, I have a couple of intuitions about what design is and I guess that's partly what I'll learn um, over the uh, next few days. I have an intuition that it's, it's stuff that happens in a very planned, but as I say that I think, but a lot of it's also really unplanned or unintended at the interface of humans in various individualities and collectivities and all the non-humans there are. Um, and I also have some kind of intuition that design is stuff that brings things together that aren't the same as each other, that are different kinds of orders of things. But I have no idea if those, those intuitions about design are just obvious to designers or don't make any sense at all, but um, in, insofar as those are my intuitions about design, it would, do, wouldn't surprise anybody to know that it seems absolutely at the heart of STS um, and absolutely appropriate that we should be more concerned with um, matters of design. Okay, um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a, the recent era of building buildings for the life sciences. Um, and uh, I, in California, we have this expression, you may have heard it, um, real estate porn like real estate pornography, this habit that people have of going to look at beautiful buildings. Does it exist? Does it translate? Um, of going to look at beautiful buildings to, um, as something that people can't resist doing and you always imagine yourself in a different life or you imagine yourself more successful. Um, I, I, have, I don't really know what the, uh, the, the pornographic component of that is, but it's a really common expression, real estate porn. Well, this is the era of um, science real estate porn. Um, just incredible numbers of incredibly gorgeous buildings are being built around the world at the moment for the purpose of doing the sciences, and in particular, the life sciences. Um, they're, they're coming up everywhere in the field, in the private sector, and in universities, uh, and in combinations of the two. And what I want to focus on today is a shift from what I'm seeing as an iconic building at the beginning of the science real estate porn era to some of the buildings of the, of, that, are go, that are being constructed right now or have been constructed in very recent years 
and see what that says about what's changed, about what the life sciences are, and what their contract with society might be. Okay. So on my cover slide here, um, some of you may recognize this building. It's the Salk Institute, and this is a this is a, a, a California, this is a shot at a sunset, so um, I spent some time in San Diego in the glory days of STS there, L at least we like to think that, um, when uh, Stephen Chapin and Bruno Latour and Chandra Mukherjee and Michael Lynch were all there and um, we were being trained. And this, we would walk down here and this was our view with the sun at the end of, the, of this simple, um, water that runs down the middle of these two lab buildings on either side of the Salk Institute. And down below that is the Pacific Coast. So you have this kind of um, infinity pool uh, aspect, uh, go, which is very Californian, going on here. Okay, so just to step back for a second, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that STS is a design discipline. Um, it's concerned with the construction of scientific facts and the design of technologies, and always has been. Um, and it's concerned with the ontological and epistemological array of design elements necessary for those two things. Um, just to give you an idea, though, of how varied this interest in what I'm thinking is design is in STS, I just wanted to rehearse a few of the tropes that um, I think have design at their heart. Um, so uh, of the first place to start, obviously, is Latour and Woolgar's uh, Laboratory Life, um, which was uh, a study of uh, Guillemin's lab in, uh, at the Salk Institute. Um, and there you absolutely get the sense of the importance of place in all kinds of ways. Um, to the, and also the, the way that different elements have to be brought together to produce the product of that site, which is um, the scientific paper, the potentially highly cited scientific paper. For quick look forward, we're in a moment right now where it's not entirely clear what the product of academic work is going to be or is currently. Um, there's a publishing crisis, as everybody knows, um, open access is something that is both seems necessary and doesn't work, uh, and so on. Um, another um, metaphor that's uh, quite powerful that I think uh, resonates a lot with issues around design is Peter Gallison's uh, um, concept of trading zones. Um, uh, he uses that concept to talk, and he uses um, theories of um, taken, drawn from sociolinguistics, theories of pigeonization and creolization uh, to talk about the ways that different epistemic cultures come to work together um, to make advances. And this connects a lot to what Professor Volonté was saying, drawing on the work of Karen Knorstina. Um, and thinking of Sheila Jasanoff's reminder that a lot of the ways in which place, space, and identity make and constrain what can be conceived and can, how it's understood, how it comes to signify, um, happens in these imagined communities and in imagined communities that have different levels of political jurisdiction. Um, she pays attention in her work a great deal to the continued salience of the modern nation state, but she also draws our attention to epistemic um, cultures that come, as it were, from below, um, uh, people's uh, civilian knowledges and um, transnational and international ways of talk and globalized ways of talking and thinking about things in the scientific frame. Um, then there's Donna Haraway's concepts. Um, draw, um, I'm thinking in particular of her work in Teddy Bear Patriarchy and um, the ways that designing a museum exhibit contains within it um, aspirations for growing science, uh, the remnants of empire, race, gender, and so on. Without all those things, the museum exhibits she describes couldn't have happened, and in turn, the museum exhibits co-produce those uh, conditions of relationality. Um, Lucy Suchman's plans and situated actions at the human-machine design interface 
Alondra Nelson's notion of body and soul um, and thinking about the place of science in the protest tradition. Um, and in my more recent book, I've uh, compared labs in different cultures to see how the same science is practiced in different ways, in different places, even while they're competing over an international um, a putative brain drain of talent. Okay. So, uh, what was the Salk Institute then? Um, and I'm sure many of you in the audience are architects and know so much more about it, this than I do, but, I, but I'm talking about it now from the point of view of somebody who um, is an eth primarily an ethnographer and to some extent an archivist myself, um, who's trained in the life sciences and in science and technology studies. Uh, it was built in 1962, designed by the architect Louis Kahn, um, and it has a layout that many people have described as being, as resonating with monasteries and as having a quasi-religious um, cast to it. Uh, but rather than it being religious explicitly, it's a, in some sense the repudiation of religion. It's the finding of the limitless you, can, you see the, ever, the infinity, the aspect of infinity in the horizon um, in, in the pursuit of truth and in science. Its founders were, um, the, the people associated with the early days of it were Jonas Salk, um, who got, was responsible with the March of Dimes for getting the money for it, and he was a close friend of Kahn's. Um, who, uh, eradic who, who um, discovered the um, polio, developed the polio vaccine. Um, Francis Crick, one, one of the uh, discoverers of the um, double helix uh, structure, um, and, uh, the, and then Kahn himself, and the tradition of the, the technologically and scientifically ambitiously embedded tradition of American hypermodernist or beyond modernist Cold War architecture. So science is gargantuan in this. Um, this is a space that it's, it's very of this world, and yet it's a, it's, a, it's a site of worship in a way. Many people have also described this place as an intellectual retreat. Um, some of its characteristics which resonated with or were part of what the life sciences was trying to do in that period in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and it continues to be an incredibly important site of life, of life science knowledge production. But two of its innovations at, in terms of design as a space to do science um, are evident in these two pictures. Actually, they're not, they're not terribly clear, but what I want to draw your attention to, first of all, is the way in which the architecture collaborates with engineering. So the rooms are engineered to um, mean that they don't have to be any columns in the middle of the labs. So these labs are, are these very, very large open spaces. And the idea was that, that people would easily collaborate. So there's already an ideal of collaboration there, although you will see that it's rather different from the quote-unquote participatory ideal we have today, um, or at least in some parts we have today. Um, it had all kinds of novelties. It, had lights that, it has lights that move around so that you can move from bench to bench and change where you do your work. Um, and the other really, really interesting, so if you take the architectural tour, so I take architectural tours of science buildings whenever I can. I love to do this. Um, they point out to you these service stories. So in between the big lab, you see the three big lab spaces in the second picture there on the right. And in between are these, are these service layers where the gas and air and all the pipes and wires and things and electricity all, come, uh, all can drop down into these in, um, through, the, through these bars at the top into the uh, labs so that you can work freely in this open space. And that's, a, and that's a feature that's been retained. I don't think um, it's an exaggeration to say that this, is an I, this building is an icon of the life sciences and continues to be evident in the design of many, many buildings today. Okay, so, um, so contrasting then the Salk Institute with newer temples, I'm calling them temples, to the life sciences. So if the Salk Institute was a scientific retreat of the most aestheticized modernist kind, 
This was in the service of life science that was revealing the fundamental building blocks of life and eradicating the greatest scourges of mankind. Um, it blends an engineering-friendly architectural practice with new frontiers for life sciences. So these metaphors of frontier, um, of uh, service to mankind, and the, the gender of the expression mankind, I think is entirely appropriate there. Um, and also the idea of probing the fundamental building blocks of life. Um, these are enormously ambitious. These are getting into, it's the moment at which biology starts to become like physics. It starts to get at fundamentals. Um, and this is a building that's appropriate for that. It's also a Cold War frontier. It's also something that's going to assert at the same time the value of open inquiry, collaboration, the freedom to do basic research, and scientific and technological supremacy. If we fast forward to the buildings that are going up today in the life sciences, and I only know some of them, and again, may, maybe many of you are real experts in this, um, we see some things that are um, extremely different going on, um, despite, as I say, echoes back to the sulk. So many of the buildings today have built in them this trajectory that people call, in the US at least, bench to bedside. The idea being that it will encompass in the entire building science that's conceptualized not just as basic research into and of itself, but as something that must begin as basic research. If it wasn't free and open inquiry, it wouldn't come up with the best possible knowledge, but which is nonetheless part of an innovation trajectory where it will be picked up by R&D, with venture capital, with a combination of public funding, and private capital and developed into usable products that will then both help solve the world's grand social challenges. So the bedside is, is a biomedical uh, uh, metaphor. It's to do with having, going all the way to the clinic, having treatments ready in the clinic. Um, so it'll solve the, the, uh, the uh, grand, grand social challenges um, from curing diseases through to mitigating climate change um, but it will also reinvigorate or regenerate uh, the economy. So it's going to be fiscal, a fiscal trickle down at the same time as, as bringing about delivering a social good. So it's a very progressivist model of um, what science and, and the life sciences in particular can do. But note that it's not a redistributive model. So it's not a model based on taxation. It's in fact, it's a model where the public is taxed to fund the basic science and then pr the pri private sector building on the work of, of the basic science will do its thing. There will be a trickle-down effect that will invigorate the economy in general um, and uh, uh, there, there will be products that then can be used to mitigate, to pick up or mitigate the social ills or the social problems. It's not an, ide it's not an ideal that brings um, health disparities, for example, into the lab. It's not an idea that looks across differences of kinds of illness or treatments the way that so much of public health does. Um, the iconic new buildings for today are also often in touch with their environments. Now, you would say that um, the sulk is in touch with its environment in, the, in many senses, in the, in the sense that it's, it's gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. But... And it, in, in its innovations around the kinds of concretes it used, and you can, if you go and look, there are different colors of concrete. So there, there was a lot of exploration going on with the kinds of concrete. Um, and there's combinations of concrete and wood used in very interesting ways. Um, but it, the point was not to let the environment in or um, be at one with the environment. Um, the point was th there's a monumentality to it that's incredibly important. Um, some of today's science buildings, um, especially one that I'm going to talk about in a minute, which absolutely picks up on references in quite a postmodern way, the Salk Institute, nonetheless bring in the environment in a, in a much newer way. And they tend to be explicitly, that tends to explicitly connect to work being done in those places to feed the world, to promote sustainability, to mitigate climate change and things like that, as well as being a statement that those are real objects in this world, 
that climate change is real and needs battling, that GMO foods won't poison you, um, but, should, but can in fact solve human problems. And third, there's a kind of, um, there, there's a, in some of these new science temples, um, there is a tremendous amount of participatory, spaces designed to be participatory. With huge limits, and in very, and many people in STS have written about the, the, uh, the ups and the downs of so-called participatory science, and many of us are also involved in designing exhibits for science museums and things in more participatory modes. Um, this includes space in buildings, but it also includes the way in which information flows. In the life sciences, that's partly because the range of practices of biobanking, bioinformation, bio-curation that are necessary today as we move into the era of regenerative and synthetic biologies um, require us also to design our information in ways that are newly participatory. You can no longer just have turn cells and bits of human bodies into things that are part of, of nature, part of the commons, they continue now to refer back to the people from whom they are taken. So that the organization of information, organization of the substrates of the science itself also has to be very participatory. Okay, so the first building I'm going to talk about um, it is one I was just now mentioning, which is the Sainsbury Laboratory. Um, and uh, it was, sorry, I seem to be missing a number here. It's, it was built in 2010, um, Lord Sainsbury, part of the Sainsbury family in the UK, um, the supermarket chain. Um, it ha has an funds an enormous amount of life sciences and neuroscience and uh, it, was, it was built by the architect Stanton Williams. Like the Salk, and like the, uh, it's, it, it's won many prizes in the last few years. Um, <coughs> it was also, it's also been described by the architects and by others as being explicitly resonant of monastic life. So this is not, not a participatory building, um, but in this case, what, what's supposedly striking about it is the way that the scientists inside flow and react to each other and the way in which the building is positioned in the Botanic Gardens. So the Botanic Gardens is, uh, in, in, so it's in Cambridge University. Botanic Gardens are laid out by, by um, people who were um, in conversation with Darwin. So the history is very resonant. It is, it is the life sciences. Um, it's near the herbarium and this is a building dedicated to plant genetics. Plant genetics isn't dealing with humans, so it doesn't have to deal in the same way with the participatory public. It's dealing with, with the genetics of plants, but it's risen incredibly in importance in recent years because of the rise of biofuels, because of the rise of synthetic biology, because of the rise of GMOs, um, but also the discovery of um, all kinds of regenerative properties of plants and fundamental uh, discoveries in genetics. Um, so you'll notice that in some ways it looks quite like the Salk Institute, but it's got these motifs of the plant. So wh where the, the Salk absolutely had, although it was planted among the trees on that Torrey Pines Bluff, it has absolutely no foliage at all until you get to the, the citrus grove part of it. That, that pathway, that walkway to the setting sun is devoid of greenery. This one has these very stylized plants and it literally sits within the botanic gardens. Inside the, um, the Sainsbury lab, there's an enormous amount of wood. Some people have described it as being um, which is sustainably uh, derived. Some people have described it as being, um, having an Eastern type feel to it. Um, and in terms of how you're supposed to do your science in this building, it also has um, open labs uh, and they're, they, they're modular to some extent. They can only move on lines, but you can move the desks around how close they are to each other and how many um, are, and you can move the walls between to make the different sizes of the labs. Um, different. It also has this various features that we associate with contemporary office buildings where you think, have they gone mad? You know, you walk into these brand new corporate buildings and you'll see people pulling down 200,000 pounds a year 
sitting in a communal space, talking on their headphones to their colleagues um, over in some other, you know, some other country in some other time zone, sitting cheek by jowl with someone else who's doing exactly the same thing, because supposedly they're going to, there's going to be, they're going, it's the end of the era of the individual office, and everything's going to flow, and there's going to be much less vertical hierarchy. Of course, everybody just recognizes the vertical hierarchy in other ways in any of these spaces I've ever been to. Um, these so supposedly open meeting rooms that anyone can use become solely under the reservation power of one particular person, and so on. So in fact, I don't believe that they do work like that. But this, this shares a lot of that sort of corporate ideology. It's got this, but it's also really aestheticized. It's not a bureaucratic space. It's very spare and clean and not excessively aestheticized. Um, the director of the lab, a, a wonderful woman who's a, a tremendous spokesperson, um, Professor Otteline Liza, a tremendous spokesperson for British science, for plant genetics and so on, has her own corner and an enormous office at the back of the building. But it's kind of out of sight of the ideology of the space, um, which is these open seating spaces and then there are uh, whiteboards in all the little nooks where you can meet where you're supposed to have your ideas all in common and breakout rooms where small groups can go and have meetings whenever needed. Okay, so turning to, so that's, that's one model of, of the temples of science today that absolutely reflects things that we're doing in science at the moment. Um, Another model that uh, is, has uh, received an enormous amount of press and where I also spent some time um, touring the facilities is Biopolis, the city of life sciences in Singapore. Um, the, the Biopolis phase one was um, designed by um, Zaha Hadid. Uh, you probably couldn't get a more um, global and it architect than Hadid. And, um, Biopolis is one of the, the designs for Biopolis are one of the, the studio's um, productions. Biopolis is a city, it's much more like Googleplex, um, it's much more like one of those Silicon Valley things which have, to use Irving Goffman's expression, total institution qualities. You go in and you're enveloped, you're supposed to love it so much that you couldn't possibly be miserable. Um, you, there's cookies everywhere, and um, you can tell that the time I spent at uh, Googleplex, I did not uh, resonate with at all. But um, uh, you know, there's food everywhere, and you can play ping pong, and you can do your laundry, and you can get your hair cut, and there's a childcare centre, and, and it's this idea that you that the new young entrepreneurs live in their place of work, and they love their work. So it's a it's, it's a vocation in the newer sense. So if we think of a Weberian sense of science as a vocation, it's not that at all, because the whole point is innovation, not vocation. Nonetheless, it has in common with that idea of science as a vocation, the idea that you inhabit and live in your place of work. These sky bridges, so-called, between the different modules of um, Biopolis, and the modules are all called things like Helios, and they've, got, they've all got these biological sounding names, um, literally allow you to walk from lab to lab, from building to building, from center to center, without exiting the building space itself. So you, you're contained within this, this um, total institution. Um, this, this building is, um, extreme, is particular to, to Singapore. It's very Singapore in the sense that it's got that one north. Its address is one north, and it's got that one degree north where the hub of the world um, with city-state uh, uh, resonance to it, that it's the place to do business and it's the place to produce knowledge all at once. Um, in my book, Good Science, I described it as an, as an internationalist space in the sense of the, the way that the labs are laid out, that if you go in, for example, to the zebrafish tanks, which is a, a prominent model species there, not surprisingly, because it's a tropical fish available in the waters around there, um, you can choose what system of maintenance you have. You can maintain your zebrafish the way Germans do, where you control everything, and then you, do, you control the temperature and the pressure and the food and things, supposedly, this is what I was told. 
um, and then you vary what happens to the fish themselves with all those background conditions controlled, or you can go into another lab of zebrafish where you do it the American way, where you can vary the temperature, you can vary the food that they have, you can vary the lighting that the fish get, and you do your experiments also including variations in, um, in topic. And they're just enormous, kind of underpopulated. So a lot of the discourse about Biopolis has been about its underpopulation. Um, you, get, you can choose the system that you want to work on, and you, Singaporean and um, international uh, superstar scientists are, are strongly recruited to come and fill this place up. Um, the other really important characteristic of this kind of space and this kind of architecture is that it literally is the, the, the mind merge, the blend of the state and the private sector. Some of the units are, are funded by the private sector, some are funded by the state, many of them um, are ha inhabited by groups that are funded by both. And the idea is that the knowledge and product that's produced, the innovation chain will seamlessly move from public funding to private um, uh, finance generation, that that will all happen within this space and the architecture is designed to produce that and the science space itself is designed to produce science that very quickly moves to its, um, to its, uh, to its, from, its from the bench to the bedside, to its telos of uh, bringing uh, innovation to bear. Um, so where, where I, just to return to that for a second, so where, in California at, at UC Berkeley, um, it's very, very common for me to be in groups of people where the word innovation is quite simply a synonym for the word research. There's just no difference. So the idea that research might be something that has absolutely no point or that you find in an archive or that you do um, to, in, to enliven your own mind or to communicate with six people in your core set um, is not alive and well at all. Uh, it's, it, what you're supposed to be doing is, is showing why it's important, showing what, what it's solving, but also showing its way to either the public good through the private capital model of the public good, which is phil philanthropic, or bilanthropy as we call it after Bill Gates. Um, so not redistributive in, an, in, the, in the sense that anybody gets the money themselves, redistributive in the sense that you get the cures or you get the product of the techno innovation. You don't get the uh, means, any kind of control of the means or mode of production. Um, so this, this, is, this is a temple to innovation and this is that model where life science is that thing that is in a way the funda this is the physics of the fundamental building blocks of of innovation. It's going to the merge between information and the biological is happening in these spaces and the merge between public and private funding is happening in these spaces. And again, the fiscal model is one of that is absolutely um, part of a genealogy that includes finance. It is about creating um, things that, that produce their own kinds of value rather than more of an appropriative um, natural resource model. Okay, so the third um, and final building that I want to talk about is um, uh, it's another English building. It's the Crick Institute that's going up in London at the moment. And uh, I recently had a hard hat tour of the building site. Um, and this is, uh, this is doing yet more things. It's doing, it's doing um, some other things that are absolutely characteristic of the life sciences right now as opposed to the beginning of the modern era of the life sciences um, after the discovery of the um, structure of the double helix and during the Cold War. So this is another iconic building. Um, it's, you, you'll see the genealogy, you see the chain of connection. It's called the Francis Crick Institute. So it's named for Crick. So that, that trajectory keeps being marked and named. Um, but it doesn't look anything like the Salk. Um, it actually, it doesn't. It has some things in common with the Sainsbury Labs, some things in common with Biopolis, but it, um, its really important aspect is the way in which it's trying to be all kinds of what they're calling participatory. Um, 
Is it a temple? It doesn't look like a temple in the way that the others look like a temple. It isn't, you know, the Biopolis looks like something out of a, out of a, a dystopic or utopic science fiction film, but definitely with that monumentality. And the Sainsbury Lab and the Salk Institute definitely are explicitly temple-esque. Um, to my absolute surprise in having the tour of this, it turns out that there is a massive cross in this thing. It's designed around a cross of light. So it has light running right through the center there, and then there's a transept of, of light running across the middle. Um, whether or not that's intentional, whether or not the idea of having a cross of light is intentional, I don't know. But it's certainly supposed to be a magnet. It's supposed to be something that people come to. If you go to their website, which is very busy, it doesn't look like a nice spare scientific institute website it will boast about numbers of people that come to it as if it's attracting congregants. Um, of course, it's explicitly non-religious as well in the way that all these religious buildings are non-religious. Um, so what do I mean by, and what do they mean by the participatory aspect of it? Um, they're play, paying an enormous amount of attention to so-called participation and to so-called public engagement. Um, the building was designed to um, bring, draw the public in. Um, it was designed to draw the public in in various ways, a particular focus on education, nothing new in the public understanding of science literature, nothing new in museum design, um, in that you try to reach the youth and it's a way to impart civic virtue. It's also a way to impart theories of knowledge um, and that's at the heart of what we study in, in STS. Um, so this is a, sorry, it's a rather um, fuzzy picture, but this is the, the um, atrium here where people are, are drawn in. But let me point out that the, um, this pod here, which is going to have um, films and things projected on it, um, and people go inside to watch visual material, is closed off from the space of the rest of the lab. Um, this public area here that you can walk into is like walking into the atrium of a cathedral or something. You can't actually get into the lab part. So the lab part you get to up by the side and there are, gate, there are locked gates and there are guards and there are going to go on being those. Um, and when, so as I was going around, I was asking about all of this. Um, and the reason for that is that um, Ex the ex explicit reason is animal rights activists, is the idea that they will go on using animal models and for research, and that if we let the public in too far, this is England, so the people who are going to object are likely to be animal rights activists, anti-vivisectionists. And so in fact, the public can't go in. They can, be, they can worship, but they can't really. So what form of participation it is, is up for, up for grabs. So despite the rhetoric of the public coming into the belly of the beast, um, and all kinds of events organized around giving feedback and being very transparent. They're using the word transparent quite a bit. And despite the idea that there will be participatory exhibits, it's, not, it's still not something that invites the public into the lab space itself. Okay, so the building design in general then in these buildings um, reflects how people are thinking about science today. Um, from participation to sustainability to interdisciplinarity. Um, the information design reflects the rise of big data and the need to manage the public and markets and privacy and the state. So um, it's the, des the design function is, is moving along all of those trajectories. The knowledge design, the way in which you come up with scientific knowledge, the way in which you produce scientific knowledge is deeply implicated in and reflected in these design elements. There's an isomorphism between what the life sciences are today and where their biggest challenges are and the way that these buildings are conceptualized and built and designed um, to produce cutting edge life science research. As always in STS, you can ask who's in and who's out. Um, and you, can, you would say that the environment is in, in some ways, but again, it's very limited, um, but the ideal of sustainability is there, um, and the public is in, um, but in strictly controlled ways. Um, so unlike the Sulk there, even at, even at the Sainsbury Lab, there's a, the public events can happen, and there's an a auditorium for public, public talks. Um, 
What questions can be asked, asked about these sites? Um, so I think that in their designs, they raise their own questions um, in the sense that they, um, in their very design, integrate with the market in ways that just weren't true in the past. They raise the question of what's, what happens to the sciences when it becomes absolutely fungible with the market? Is there anything that's lost in terms of research culture, in terms of the production of scientific knowledge, in terms of ethics, in terms of uh, ways that people can and should live, and in, in terms of redistributive ethics? Um, and it, there, it also raises its own questions in the way that it brings the public in, particularly the Crick Institute, what is it that we're trying to achieve with public participation? Is public participation a new paradigm, or is it really, in fact, still a download? Is it still the old model where what science does is educate the public about what they should think, and that what we should be interested in is the public understanding of science? Public participation in science was supposed to be a new paradigm. It was supposed to be brought about by um, ethically contentious science. It was supposed to be brought about by the rise of biomedicine and the fact that our own body parts were becoming substrates for science. But are we, in fact, in a different paradigm? Is this a different moment? Or is the involvement of the public in these, in these spaces still really just a sort of hands-on exhibit version of the public understanding of science? So just to wrap up then, um, the SOLC doesn't disappear. It continues to be one of the very top life science laboratory spaces in terms of publications and productivity and innovation. Um, and that's a general point that's often made in STS, that these genealogies don't mean that, that the old disappears. In fact, one of the things we've discovered around science genealogies is that older ways of doing things keep reappearing. Uh, there's a kind of re recapitulation of phylogeny that goes on, um, and there's always a potential around them for, them for them to rise up and lead to protests. Um, and these new icons don't resolve the questions that their buildings reflect. They don't resolve the questions of the relations between the life sciences and the market, life sci between life sciences and climate change, um, a public who talks back. But they do pose, even in setting limits to, to these, these questions, they do pose the challenges and center them as relevant. So these concerns then are literally part of the built environments of these labs, showing in another instantiation that scientific knowledge is co-produced with its social order, um, a version of the original STS aim. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>